داوي نفوسنا لنحس في أعماقنا أعماقنا الإيمان فؤاد كالحجرات قسوة فإذا وعد القرآن حين لا 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 فؤاد كالحجرات قسوة But what about a person who does not believe in God himself? If a person does not believe in God, where is the question of Quran being a word of God? So now we have dealt with the majority of the people, but yet there is a large percentage who are atheists, who do not believe in God himself. How do we deal with them? When I meet an atheist, and if he says that he does not believe in God, the first thing I do is, I congratulate that atheist. Now you may wonder, that why is Zakir congratulating an atheist? The reason I'm congratulating him is because, most of the human beings, they are doing blind belief. Most of the Christians, the Christians, because the father is a Christian. He's a Hindu, because the father is a Hindu. Some of them are Muslims, because the father is a Muslim. They aren't thinking. This person, he's thinking. He may be coming from a religious background, but he may not agree that the God which his parents are worshipping is what to be called as God. The reason I congratulate atheist is because he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, Islamic creed, La ilaha, there is no God. The only thing I have to do is prove to him, Illa Allah, but Allah, which I shall do, inshallah. To the other non-Muslims, to the other non-Muslims, first, I have to prove to him that the God he's worshipping is false. So half the time I waste in trying to prove that the God he's worshipping is false. Here, half my job is done, la ilaha. Only thing left for me is illa Allah and then Muhammad Rasulullah. But Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon the Messenger of Allah. Now this atheist, he rejects God because he has the wrong concept of God. Now anyone who says he does not believe in God, First, I'll ask him, what is the definition of God? For anyone to reject anything, he should know its definition. For example, if I say, this is a pen, for you to say it is not a pen, you should know the definition of pen. If you don't know the definition of pen, you cannot say this is not a pen. Is it clear? Do you agree with me or not? If I say this is a pen, for you to say it is not a pen, you have to know the definition of pen, otherwise, you cannot logically say it's not a pen. There was a smart person. He said, no, Brother Zakir. I know that's a book. So even if I don't know the definition of a pen, I can say it's not a pen. I know it's a book. So why should I know the definition of pen? So I said, fine. Do you know that's a book? He says, yes. I say, this, this is a kitab. If he said, no, it's not a kitab. He knows the definition of book, but does not know the definition of kitab. Kitab, in Arabic and Urdu, means a book. If I say this is a pen, knowing definition of a pen is more important than knowing what is this. Same way, if a person says there's no God, I'll first ask him, what is the definition of God? The definition they give is when they see that a God tells a lie, a God can be defeated, the God, he can be killed, 
So when we hear all these stories of God telling a lie, a God can be defeated, a God can be killed, a God can die, a God requires to eat. So they reject the God. Who are they rejecting? They are rejecting the false gods, La Ilaha. Similarly, someone, if he believes that Islam is a religion of terrorism, Islam is a merciless religion, Islam is an unscientific religion, Islam is a religion which does not give rights to the woman, and he rejects this Islam. I say, even I reject such Islam. Because I know that Islam is a merciful religion. Islam, it's a scientific religion. Islam has human rights. Islam has women rights. So what do I do? I tell him, the Islam you believe and you reject, it should be rejected, but true Islam is, then I present to him the true Islam. Similarly, when these people are rejecting the false God, we have to present to them what is the true God. And the best definition of Almighty God, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, given in the Quran, is from Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Kul ho Allah ahad. Say, He is Allah one and only. Allah samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Lam yirid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kuffan ahad. There is nothing like him. This is a four-line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any person saying that so-and-so person is God, if that person fits in this four-line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that person as God. The first is, Kul wallahuad, says Allah one and only. Second is, Allah samad, Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam milid wa lam yulad, he begets not nor is he begotten. Walam yakul lahu kufanad, there is nothing like him. There are many people who say that Dajnish, he is Almighty God. Let us put this Bhagavan Dajnish to the test of Surah class. There's a person who asked me a question at the time, that Brother Zakir, we Hindus do not believe in Bhagavan Dajnish to be God. I never said that Hindus believe Bhagavan Dajnish to be God. I've read the Hindu scripture. Nowhere do the Hindu scripture say Bhagavan Dajnish is God. I said some human beings, some people believe Bhagavan Dajnish to be God. Let us put this Bhagavan Dajnish to the test of Surah class. The first is, Qul huwa Allah ahad. Says Allah one and only. Was Bhagavan Dajnish one and only? Was he the only man who claimed divinity? There are hundreds who have claimed divinity. And in this country alone, there are thousands who have claimed that they were gods. He's not the only one. But the Rajnish Bhakt will say, no, he is one and only, he is unique. Let's go to the next test. Allah Samad. Allah, the absolute eternal. Was Rajnish absolute eternal? We know from the autobiography of Rajnish, he says that he was suffering from asthma, from chronic backache, from diabetes mellitus. Imagine Almighty God suffering from asthma, chronic backache, diabetes mellitus. Third test is, Lam yulid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. We know Bhagavan Rajnish. He was born in Madhya Pradesh. And later on, in 1981, he goes to America and takes thousands of Americans for a ride. And in the state of Oregon, he starts his village called as Rajnishpuram. Later on, the American government, they arrest him and they put him behind bars. And Rajnish, he alleges that the American government they slow poisoned me in the prison. Imagine Almighty God being slow poisoned. Later on, the American government, the king of the country, he comes back to India and goes back to the city of Pune, where he has a center, which is now called as Osho Commune. And when you go to the center, if you go to Samadhi, it is mentioned there on Samadhi, Bhagavan Rajnish, Osho, never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December 1931 to the 19th of January 1990. Never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December 1931 to the 19th of January 1990. They forgot to mention on a Samadhi that he was not given visas to more than 21 countries of the world. Almighty God coming to visit the world and he requires visas. And the Archbishop of Greece said, 
that if you don't remove Rajneesh out of this country, we'll burn his house and the house of his disciple. And the last test, Walam Kuffan Ad, that nothing like him is so stringent that no one besides the true Almighty God can pass. The moment you can compare God to anyone in this world, to anyone in the universe, he's not God. Walam Kuffan Ad, there's nothing like him. Suppose someone says that Almighty God is a thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger. You may have heard the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger, the person who got the title Mr. World, the strongest man in the world, Mr. Universe, the strongest man in the universe. If someone says that Almighty God is a thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger, the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, whether it be Arnold Schwarzenegger, whether it be Dara Singh, whether it be King Kong, whether it be a thousand times or a million times, the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he is not God. There's nothing like him. You know Bhagavan Rajnish, he wore white clothes, he had a beard, he had two eyes like the human beings, one nose, two hands. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he is not God. Otherwise, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 110. Kulidullah Abidur Rahman, Ayamatadu, follow Allah Asmal Husna. Say call upon him by Allah or by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belong the most beautiful names. You can call Allah by any name, but it should be a beautiful name. It should not conjure up a mental picture. It should be a name given by himself. And this message, besides being mentioned in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse 110, it's also mentioned in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse 180, in Surah Ta'a, chapter number 20, verse number 8, as well as Surah Hashar, chapter 59, verse number 24, that to Allah belong the most beautiful names. Many of the atheists, they believe in science. All these arguments may not satisfy them completely. Many of the atheists, they say that science is a yardstick. They believe science is ultimate. So let's try and prove to this group of atheists also about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if I know that this atheist believes only in science, after congratulating him, I'll ask him a simple question. That if suppose there is equipment, there is a gadget who no one in the world has ever seen, and if that gadget is bought in front of you, and if the question is asked, that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this gadget? That atheist, he may say, after thinking for a while, the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of a gadget who no one in the world has ever seen, no one in the world knows about it, he will tell you that the creator of that gadget. Or he may say the maker of the gadget. He may say the inventor, he may say the producer, he may say the manufacturer. Whatever he says, it will be somewhat similar. Either creator, manufacturer, producer, maker, inventor, somewhat similar. Just keep that answer at the back of your mind. The second person is the creator, if he says to somebody else, he'll come to know, or a person who does research, but that is secondary. You ask this atheist that how did our universe come into existence? So he will tell you that our universe was initially one primary nebula. Then there was a secondary separation, a big bang, which gave rise to galaxies, stars, moon, sun, and the earth on which we live. This he calls as the big bang. You ask him, when did you come to know about this creation of the universe, about the big bang? He will tell you about 50 years back, 40 years back. So you tell him, this thing what you're mentioning about the Big Bang is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, where Allah says, Avalam yaral lazina kafuru. Do not the unbeliever see, anna samawati wal arda, kaan atrat kan fatakna huma, that the heaven and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. What you're talking about the Big Bang is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? So he will tell, maybe it's a fluke. Somebody wrote it? No problem. Don't argue with him. Ask him the next question. What is the shape of the earth? So he will tell you, previously the human beings thought that the world was flat. It was in 1577 when Sir Francis Drake, he sailed around the earth 
that he proved that the earth was spherical. You tell him. That the Quran mentions in Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 30, that wal ard ba da zalika dahaha. We have made the earth X shape. The Arabic word dahaha, one of its meaning is an expanse, and the earth is an expanse. The other meaning is derived from the Arabic word duya, which means an egg. And we know today that the earth is not completely round like a ball. It is starting from the pole and bulging from the center. It is geospherical in shape. It is somewhat similar to the egg. And the Arabic word duya does not refer to a normal leg. It specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And if you analyze the shape of the egg of an ostrich, it is geospherical in shape. Imagine the Quran mentioned that the earth is geospherical 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned that? So he will tell you, ah, your prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was an intelligent man. Don't argue. Continue. The light of the moon. Is it its own line of reflected light? So the atheist will tell you, previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. But today we know that the light of the moon is not its own light, it's a reflected light. When did you come to know? He will tell you, we came to know yesterday, 50 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back. Quran mentions 1400 years ago in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61. That blessed is he who hath placed the constellation in the sky. And therein, Sun, Shams having its own light, and Moon having borrowed light. The Arabic word for Sun is Shams. Its light is always described as Siraj or Wahaj, meaning a torch or a blazing lamp. And the Moon in Arabic is called as Kamar. Its light is always described as Munir or Noor. Munir means borrowed light, and Noor means a reflection of light. And nowhere is the moonlight described as Wahaj or Siraj. It's always described as Noor or Munir. Borrowed light or reflection of light. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 14 years ago? Now there'll be a pause. Don't wait for the reply. Continue. When I was in school, I had learned that the sun revolved, but it was stationary. It did not rotate about its axis. The Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, nahara. It is Allah who has created the night and the day, washamsa wal kamar, the sun and the moon, kullun fi falaki yasbahoon, each one traveling in an orbit with its own motion. The Arabic word yasbahoon describes the motion of a moving body. And if it's talking about a celestial body, it means that this sun and the moon, besides revolving, it's also rotating about its own axis. And today science tells us, that the sun takes approximately 25 days to complete one rotation. Imagine what I read in school. I finished my school in 1982. Sun was stationary. 1400 years before the Quran says the sun rotates. And my science book said the sun was stationary. Today, it has been incorporated that the sun rotates. You ask him, that who could have mentioned this? There will be a silent pause. Some critics will say it is nothing great that the Quran speaks about astronomy because the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy. I do agree, the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy, but I'd like to remind them that it was centuries after the Quran was revealed that the Arabs became advanced in the field of astronomy. So it is from the Quran that the Arabs learned about astronomy and not the vice versa. In the subject of hydrology, when you ask the atheist, that you ask him about the water cycle, he will tell you that the water evaporates from the ocean. It forms into clouds. The clouds move into the interior. It falls down as rain, and the water is replenished. We ask him, when did you come to know this? He will tell you it was in 1580, when Sir Bernard Palissy, he spoke about the water cycle for the first time. 1580. So you tell him, what you came to know in 1580, just hardly a couple of hundred years before, the Quran mentions 1400 years ago. The Quran says, the water evaporates from the ocean, formed into the clouds. The clouds move and join. They move into the interior, and they fall down as rain, and the water will be replenished. The water cycle is spoken in the Quran in great detail in several places. It's mentioned in Surah Zumur, chapter 39, verse number 21. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24. In Surah Hijar, chapter number 15, verse number 22. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 48. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43. 
It's mentioned in Surah Naba, chapter number 17, verse number 12 to 14. It's mentioned in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse 57. In Surah Raj, chapter number 13, verse number 17. It's mentioned in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 40 and 49. It's mentioned in Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 34. It's mentioned in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 9. It's mentioned in Surah Jasha, chapter number 45, verse number 5. In Surah Qaf, chapter number 50, verse number 9 and 10. It's mentioned in Surah Waqiyah, chapter number 56, verse number 67 to 70. It's mentioned in Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 11. I can go on and go on and go on, quoting only the verses in the Quran which speak about the water cycle only. The Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 14 years ago? No reply? Don't worry, continue. The Quran speaks about geology. The geologists say that the radius of the earth is 3,750 miles. The deeper layers are hot and fluid. The upper layer is a thin crust, hardly 1 to 20 miles in thickness. And there are high possibilities it will shake. It is due to the folding phenomena which gives rise to mountain ranges, which prevents the earth from shaking. Allah mentioned this in the Quran. It's mentioned in the Quran. In Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 7, as well as 8, Allah says, Wal Jibal Autada, we have made the earth as an expanse and the mountains as pegs, which science has agreed today. A similar message is mentioned in Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 31, that we have placed on the earth mountain standing firm, lest it would shake with you. In the field of oceanology, Previously, we knew that there were two types of water, salt and sweet. But the Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse number 53, that it is he who has let free two bodies of flowing water, one sweet and palatable, the other salty and bitter. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. We knew that there were two types of water, but what does the Quran mean there is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed? Today we know that whenever one type of water flows into the other type of water, it loses its constituents and gets homogenized into the water it flows. This homogenizing area is called as a barrier, a barzakh in the Quran. Quran mentioned this 14 years ago. Quran mentioned about biology. It's mentioned in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. We have created every living thing from water. Will you not then believe? Who could have believed in the deserts of Arabia that everything is made from water? Today science tells us that every living thing is made from water. There is a theory known as theory of probability. That if you make a wild guess, the chances you'll be right is depending upon what are the options. For example, if I toss a coin, head or tails, whatever reply you give, the chances you'll be right is one upon two, ha, 50%. Two options, chances you'll be right is one upon two, 50%. If I toss a coin twice, the chances I'll be right both the times is one upon two into one upon two, it is one upon four, it is 25%. If I toss a coin thrice, the chances I'll be right all three times is 1 upon 2 into 1 upon 2 into 1 upon 2, it is 1 upon 8, 12 and half percent. If I throw a dice, the dice has got six sides. The chances if I make a wild guess it will be right is 1 upon 6. Now if you apply this theory of probability that someone made a wild guess, for example, what is the shape of the earth? You can think of 10 things. Flat, square, rectangle, triangular, hexagonal, on and on, maybe spherical. The chances if you make a wild guess it is spherical, it will be right is 1 upon 10. If you ask a person, the light of the moon, is it its own light or reflected light? If he makes a wild guess, chances will be right is 1 upon 2. The chances that both are right, the shape of the earth and the light of the moon is not its own light, is 1 upon 10 into 1 upon 2 is 1 upon 20. That is 5 percent. All living creatures made of what? You can think of a thousand things. Sand, iron, tin, wood, on and on, maybe even water. Chances 
you make a wild guess and one is right, is one upon 1,000. Chances, all three are correct. Shape of the earth is spherical. Light of the moon is reflected. Everything is made from water. Is one upon 10 into one upon two into one upon 1,000. Is one upon 20,000. Is 0.005%. Only in three scientific facts, it's 0.005%. I've already mentioned several. And if you read my book, there are hundreds. There are many things. Quran speaks about botany. In Surah Rad, chapter number 13, verse number 3, that all the fruits are created in pairs, in sexes, male and female. Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse 53, that the plants are made in sexes, male and female, which you came to know recently. In the field of zoology, Quran says the animals and the birds live in community like the human beings. In Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 38, which we came to know recently. Quran speaks about the bee, that it can find its path, which we came to know recently. In Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 60 and 69. The Quran says that the worker bee is the female bee. Previously thought it was the male bee. Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 69, that the worker bee is the female bee. Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the spider in Surah Ankabut, chapter 29, verse number 41. The Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the ant in Surah Namal, chapter number 27, verse number 17 and 18, which we have come to know recently. Quran speaks about genetics, that it is the male fluid, it is the sperm which is responsible for the sex of the child. In Surah Najam, chapter number 53, verse number 45 and 46, as well as chapter number 75, verse number 37 to 39, which we came to know recently. Quran speaks about embryology, that all the human beings are made from alaka, a leech-like substance, something which clings. In Surah Alaq, Surah Ikra, chapter 96, verse number 2, which we came to know recently. Quran speaks about the various embryological stages. Alaka, Mudga, Izama, Lahem. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 12 to 14, which we have come to know recently. There are various scientific facts mentioned in the Quran. I'll just mention Two more. There are people who say that after we human beings die and after we are buried and our bones are disintegrated, how will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be able to reconstruct the bone on the day of judgment? So Allah says, it's mentioned in the Quran, chapter number 75, verse number 3 and 4, that when they say that how will Allah be able to reconstruct the bones on the day of judgment, tell them, Allah can not only reconstruct the bones, He can even reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of your finger. What does Allah mean by saying He can not only reconstruct your bones, He can even reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of your finger? It was in 1880 that Sir Francis Gold, he discovered the fingerprinting method and said that no two fingerprints, even in a million human beings, are identical. Today the police, the CID, the FBI, the CIA, they use the fingerprinting method to identify the criminal. Quran speaks about the fingerprinting method 1400 years ago and we discovered in 1880. Who could have mentioned this? I would like to mention one more thing before I end the scientific facts. Is that there was a scientist by the name of Prophet Takara Takashan. Prophet Takara Takashan hails from Thailand. And he was doing a great deal of research in the pain receptors. Previously, we human beings, we thought, and the doctors thought, that only the brain was responsible for the feeling of pain. Today, we come to know that there are certain receptors in the skin which are also responsible for the feeling of pain. That's the reason when a person of burn injury comes to a doctor, the doctor takes a pin and pricks it in the area of burn. If the patient feels pain, the doctor is happy. The pain receptors are intact. If the patient does not feel pain, the doctor is sad. The pain receptors have been destroyed. It's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse 56, that as to those who reject our signs, we shall cast them in the hellfire, and as often as their skins are roasted, we shall give them fresh skin so that they feel the pain. Indicating there is something in the skin which is responsible for the feeling of pain. Imagine, Quran speaks about the pain receptors 14 years ago. And Prophet Taqra Dakashan, when he came to know this is mentioned in the Quran, in the ninth medical conference in Riyadh, in the conference itself, he said the Shahada and said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah, and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon the Messenger of Allah. So when you ask the atheist, 
Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? The only reply I can give you is the same which he gave you earlier. It is the creator. It is the maker. It is the producer. It is the manufacturer. It is the inventor. This creator, this producer, this manufacturer, this maker, this inventor, we Muslims call him as Allah. That's the reason today science is not eliminating God. It is eliminating models of God. La ilaha illallah. Scientists today, they are eliminating models of God. This cannot be God. This cannot be God. They aren't eliminating God. And a famous philosopher and scientist, Francis Bacon, he said that those who have little knowledge of science, they become atheists. But those who have in-depth knowledge of science, they become a believer in God. I would like to end my talk with the quotation of the Quran from Surah Fusilat, chapter 41, verse number 53, which says, Sanurihim ayatina fil afakhi, wa fi anfusihim, hatta yatabayyira lom anna ulaq, awalam yakfi bi rabbika, anna wala kulla shayin shaheed, that soon we shall show them our signs, into the furthest regions of the horizons, and into the souls, until it is clear to them that this is the truth. Wa akhru dawana, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.